It's been over 80 years since a major conflict has broken out in Europe. The result has left many with a deep sense of uncertainty. Nearly 70% of Americans surveyed by the American Psychological Association feared that we are at the beginning stages of World War III. The prospect of nuclear conflict, once unthinkable, is now a very real possibility. Today we're going to explore the unthinkable. How would the United States respond during a nuclear conflict? What's America's nuclear war plan? How many nuclear weapons are readily available to the president? Where are they? What are their targets? How many missiles would be launched? How many casualties could we expect after American bombs reach their destinations? What would the world look like going forward? And most importantly, could the United States win a global nuclear war? The United States operates under a nuclear triad, consisting of land-based intercontinental ballistic missiles, or ICBMs, sea-based submarines armed with submarine-launched ballistic missiles, or SLBMs, and air-based strategic bombers, carrying gravity bombs and air-launched nuclear cruise missiles. Now let's take a look at each part of America's triad and its weapon delivery systems. The first and most well-known part of America's nuclear triad is its land-based intercontinental ballistic missiles, or ICBMs. The US has 400 LGM-30 Miniman-3 ICBMs that are launched via silos. These 400 missiles have a range of over 6,000 miles and have near pinpoint accuracy. When launched, the Three Strays Minuteman 3 travels at speeds of over 15,000 miles per hour, reaching its target in under 30 minutes. Each Minuteman 3 missile carries one warhead. 200 Minuteman 3 missiles are armed with a 335 kiloton W87 Mark 21A warhead, while the other half are armed with a 300 kiloton W78 Mark 12 warhead. Each warhead has around 40 times the destructive power of the bombs dropped on Japan in 1940. 45. America's Miniman 3 silos are based in three rural areas. The 90th Missile Wing at F.E. Warren Air Base in Colorado, Nebraska, and Wyoming. The 91st Missile Wing at Minot Air Force Base in North Dakota. And the 341st Missile Wing at Maelstrom Air Force Base in Montana. Each wing has three squadrons, and each squadron has 50 Miniman 3 silos. They're collectively controlled by five hardened underground control launch centers, each operated with two military officers around the clock at all times. In the event that launch command centers are destroyed in a surprise attack, or the military officers inhabiting the launch command control centers get cold feet, these missiles can and will be remotely launched from an airborne command center, carrying out orders from the president. As with all things, there are advantages and disadvantages of the silo-based Miniman 3. Its primary advantage is that these 400 missiles make the most responsive leg of the nuclear triad. America's land-based ICBM force has remained on continuous, around-the-clock 24-7 alert since 1959. They can be quickly launched in less than 5 minutes. America's silo-based ICBMs offer a strategic advantage as well. Due to their remote launch capability, an effective nuclear attack against America's Minutemen 3 silos will require at least 400 warheads, or one bomb aimed at each silo, forcing the enemy to use and deplete a considerable amount of their nuclear arsenal. But this strategic advantage also highlights the Minutemen 3's disadvantages. America's land-based Minutemen 3s are inherently vulnerable, as their location is commonly known, and therefore silos can and will be easily targeted. As a result, in the event of a large-scale attack, the president would be put in a sticky situation. He or she would have to either use these 400 missiles or lose them, forcing a large-scale retaliatory attack in response to perceived incoming warheads targeting American silos. With enemy missiles already in flight, the leader of the free world would only have 15 minutes to decide. And once a missile is launched, there is no turning back. While launching a thermonuclear intercontinental ballistic missile can be a hard decision. Protecting your personal data from Russian hackers isn't. Luckily, there's Atlas VPN. Atlas VPN is a digital tool that encrypts your data and hides your location while browsing the web. Atlas VPN has thousands of secure servers in 49 countries, allowing you to safely surf the net at the fastest possible speed, while staying away from online threats. Whenever you connect to one of Atlas's servers, your IP address is hidden and passed through their secure system. So if anyone wants to find your information, like Russian hackers, they simply can't. And right now, you can get access to Atlas VPN for three years for just $1.83 per month with a 30-day money-back guarantee. 
One of the best features offered by Atlas VPN is their data breach monitor, allowing you to search the internet to see if your email has been compromised. Atlas's data breach monitor blocks malicious ads, links, and trackers, and even notifies you if someone's trying to steal your data. But the benefits of using Atlas VPN don't stop there. Can't access your favorite TV shows on Netflix while abroad? That's not a problem anymore. Atlas VPN has you covered, allowing you to unlock your favorite content anywhere. Go to getatlasvpn.com slash modern muscle to get a three-year plan for just $1.83 per month with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Link in the description below. The second arm of America's nuclear triad is its air-based strategic bombers. The U.S. Air Force currently operates a fleet of 66 strategic bombers. America's strategic bombers are organized into nine bomb squadrons and five bomb wings at three bases. Minute Air Force Base in North Dakota, Barksdale Air Force Base in Louisiana, and Whitman Air Force Base in Missouri. There are 300 nuclear weapons currently deployed at strategic bomber bases in the U.S. An additional 100 tactical nuclear bombs are deployed at NATO air bases in Europe. America's bomber fleet consists of 46 B-52 Stratofortress bombers and 20 B-2 stealth bombers. The B-2 stealth bomber can carry up to 16 1,200 kiloton nuclear gravity bombs. Each gravity bomb contains a massive payload of 150 times the destructive power of the bomb dropped in Hiroshima. The B-52 Stratofortress bomber is a long-range heavy bomber with the ability to travel up to 9,000 miles without refueling. The B-52 carries up to 20 AGM-86 subsonic air-launched cruise missiles. When launched, the AGM-86 missile can travel over 1,500 miles at speeds exceeding 555 miles per hour, using its independent guidance system to deliver a W-80 150 kiloton warhead to its target in less than 90 seconds. Each warhead contains around 20 times the destructive power of the bomb dropped on Hiroshima. The primary advantage of using air-based strategic bombers is that they can be called back if necessary. Furthermore, subsonic air-launched nuclear cruise missiles are a lot harder to defend against. When launched, an enemy force would have to counterattack each missile individually, making defense costly and complicated. The small size also makes them difficult to detect on radar. The primary disadvantage of strategic bombers is their response time. They take a lot longer to get in the air, and if air bases aren't on high alert, or if planes aren't already in flight, there's a high probability of them being destroyed in an initial surprise attack. This is particularly true for bomber bases located in Europe. The last and most important part of America's nuclear triad are its nuclear-powered ballistic missile submarines. The U.S. Navy operates a fleet of 14 Ohio-class ballistic missile submarines. Each submarine carries 20 Trident II submarine-launched ballistic missiles. The Trident II SLBM is the most destructive weapon in America's nuclear arsenal. Each missile is armed with either four or five 475 kiloton W-88 warheads. In theory, each sub can launch its entire 20-missile payload virtually undetected in under seven minutes. When launched, the three-stage Trident II travels at speeds of over 18,000 miles per hour, has a range of over 7,500 miles, and typically reaches its target or targets in around 15 minutes. Each warhead is guided by a multiple independently targetable re-entry vehicle, or MIRV, allowing a single Trident II missile to deliver up to five warheads to five separate targets. Just one Trident II missile alone, armed with five warheads, has 154 times the destructive power of the bomb dropped on Hiroshima. Overall, the U.S. has around 70% of all of its warheads on submarines, and with good reason.
There are numerous advantages of the ballistic missile submarine. For starters, they make up the most survivable leg of the nuclear triad. Ballistic missile submarines are virtually undetectable at sea. Their stealth design makes finding one an almost impossible task, giving pause to potential adversaries. With at least 10 submarines on constant patrol at all times, ballistic missile submarines assure that the U.S. can strike at any time, anywhere, even after a surprise attack. With each sub carrying an average of 100 warheads each, they have enough firepower to make just one submarine the sixth most powerful nuclear power in the world. In terms of disadvantages, there simply are none. When people imagine a nuclear war, the first thing that comes to mind is large cities like Los Angeles and Moscow being incinerated in a blaze of nuclear hellfire. While this would definitely be a likely outcome, the reality is that around 70% of the 1800 nuclear warheads currently deployed by the United States aren't aimed at large cities, but instead at an enemy country's nuclear forces. To better understand this, we first need to take a look at America's current strategic nuclear war plan, also known as the Single Integrated Operational Plan, or PSYOP. First drawn up in 1950, the PSYOP focused primarily on the Soviet Union. While today most of the weapons in the war plan still target Russia, other countries such as China, North Korea, India, and Pakistan are included as well. In this video, we'll take a look at a nuclear exchange with the only nuclear power comparable to the United States, the Russian Federation. This portion of America's nuclear war plan is called Major Attack Option 1. Major Attack Option 1 is the most demanding attack option available to the President. Should the Commander-in-Chief order major attack option 1, the resulting attack would consist of over 1,000 warheads, targeting Russian nuclear forces, including ICBM silos, road mobile ICBMs, submarine bases, primary airfields, nuclear storage facilities, design and production complexes, critical command and control facilities, and civilian population centers. Now let's take a look at major attack option 1, its Russian targets, the American nuclear weapons used, and the overall outcome of an American thermonuclear attack on Russia. Major attack option 1 is divided into two attack options. The counterforce attack plan targets Russia's nuclear forces, while the counter value attack plan targets Russian civilian population centers and economic infrastructure, assets that Russia inherently values. First, let's take a look at America's counterforce attack option, as it's the most demanding and most likely attack option to be selected by the president. The first and most important target in major attack option 1 is Russia's silo-based ICBMs. Russia has 126 operational ICBM silos distributed throughout four missile fields, the 28th Guards Missile Division at Kazilx with 20 ICBM silos, the 60th Guards Missile Division at Tatashevo housing 60 ICBM silos, the 13th Missile Division at Domvorotsky with 24 ICBM silos, and the 62nd Missile Division at Yuzhur with 22 silos. Russia's land-based ICBM force consists of four missiles. 46 SS-18 Satans armed with one or two 800 kiloton MIRV warheads per missile. Two SS-19 Mod 4s armed with one 550 kiloton hypersonic glide vehicle warhead per missile. 60 SS-27 Mod 1s armed with one 800 kiloton warhead per missile. And 18 SS-27 Mod 2s armed with up to four 550 kiloton MIRV warheads per missile. When launched, these missiles travel at speeds of over 16,000 miles per hour, have ranges of up to 10,000 miles, and typically reach their target or targets in around 30 minutes. Altogether, these 126 missiles carry 211 warheads, representing 15% of the strategic nuclear weapons currently deployed by Russia. When added up, Russia's land-based ICBM force can deliver a total explosive yield of 150,000 kilotons, or 19,000 times the destructive power of the bomb dropped on Nagasaki in 1945. 
As with all things, there are advantages and disadvantages when attacking Russia's silo-based ICBMs. The primary advantage is that their locations are commonly known, and therefore they can be easily targeted. The primary disadvantage of attacking Russian ICBM silos is their fast launch time. Like the US ICBM force, they can be quickly launched. As a result, they need to be the first target hit in a first strike. Secondly, Russia's ICBM silos are a high threat due to their long-range targeting ability and high weapon payload. It's believed that Russia's silo-based ICBMs are exclusively reserved for targets in the U.S. Furthermore, destroying Russia's entire ICBM force in a preemptive strike can be problematic. When attacking Russia's silo-based ICBMs with nuclear weapons, one of the most critical metrics a U.S. war planner must determine is silo survivability. Silo survivability is calculated with a probability of kill, or kill probability. A Russian silo's kill probability depends on three factors. The hardness of the silo, the size or yield of the warhead delivered to the target, and the total number of warheads used to attack each silo. A silo's hardness determines its ability to withstand the effects of a thermal nuclear explosion, and thus protect the underground missile. Taking a silo's hardness and other factors such as launch malfunctions and warhead detonation failures into account. U.S. war planners would assign two high-yield warheads per silo to achieve an average kill probability of 99.5%. The United States would want to hit these silos hard and fast, so they would use C-based ballistic missile submarines to get the job done. Ballistic missile submarines are optimal due to the higher-yield warheads that they carry, their closer locations at sea, and shorter flight times, which would give Russia virtually zero warning before bombs are already hitting their targets. The attack would use a total of 252 nuclear warheads, delivered from 63 Trident II missiles, with two 475 kiloton W88 warheads targeting each silo. The attack would expend 25% of the U.S.'s sea-based ICBM force. Delivery time would be around 15 minutes from launch, and silos would be hit with ground burst detonations. Remember the term ground burst. This will be important later. Up next, we have Russia's nuclear-powered ballistic missile submarine bases and naval facilities. The Russian Navy operates 10 nuclear-powered ballistic missile submarines of two classes, five Delta IV and five Barori-class submarines. Each submarine can carry up to 16 submarine-launched ballistic missiles, with each missile armed with up to four 100-kiloton warheads. The total number of warheads carried by Russia's nuclear submarine force is around 600 warheads. Today, the principal Russian naval targets for U.S. strategic nuclear weapons are likely to be the ballistic missile submarine basing areas of the Northern Fleet and Pacific Fleet. Seven nuclear-powered ballistic missile submarines are deployed at two Northern Fleet bases, and three nuclear-powered ballistic missile submarines are deployed at one Pacific Fleet base. Since not all of Russia's nuclear-powered ballistic missile submarines are fully operational, with either one or two at various stages of maintenance, war planners must assume that many, most, or possibly all of the submarines docked at naval bases are at some stage of alert, and thus start potential stationary firing platforms. Therefore, targeting nuclear-powered ballistic missile submarine bases would be a top priority. War planners must also consider the possibility that Russian nuclear-powered ballistic missile submarines might disperse to other naval bases. As a result, other targets would include naval shipyards, ship repair yards, weapon communication centers, fleet headquarters, and refueling facilities. To achieve this, Russia's northern fleet would be targeted with a total of 92 330 kiloton W87 warheads delivered by Miniman 3 ICBMs. Narapicha Naval Base would be hit with 8 warheads, while Yagelnaya Naval Base would require 10. Russia's Pacific Fleet would be sufficiently destroyed using 45 Minuteman 3 ICBMs. Rabaki Naval Base alone will be hit with 12 330 kiloton warheads. A total of 137 Miniman 3 ICBMs will reach their naval targets within 30 minutes after launch, with a near 100% predicted kill rate, using ground bursts. Thank you. 
Up next, we have Russia's Strategic Bomber Force. The Russian Air Force currently operates a fleet of 50 strategic bombers. Russia's strategic bombers are organized into seven bomber regiments and two heavy bomber divisions at four bases. The 52nd Heavy Bomber Regiment at Shakova Air Force Base, the 22nd Heavy Bomber Division at Angles Air Force Base, the 200th Guards Heavy Bomber Aviation Regiment at Bella Air Force Base, and the 326th Heavy Bomber Division at Ukraine Air Force Base. There are over 500 nuclear weapons currently deployed at strategic bomber bases within the Russian Federation. Russia's bomber fleet consists of 39 Tu-95 MS Bear H bombers and 11 Tu-160 Blackjack bombers. The Tu-160 Blackjack can carry up to 12 250 kiloton AS-15 Kent air-launched nuclear cruise missiles. Each missile contains 30 times the destructive power of the bomb dropped on Hiroshima. The Tu-95S Bear H is a long-range heavy bomber with the ability to travel up to 8,000 miles without refueling. The Tu-95MS Bear H contains up to 16 250 kiloton AS-23 subsonic air-launched cruise missiles. The main threat to the United States posed by Russian bombers lies in the AS-15 Kent and AS-23 air-launched nuclear cruise missiles that they carry. As it's generally understood that today the chance of Russian bombers penetrating U.S. airspace to drop gravity bombs is near zero. These air-launched nuclear cruise missiles have a range of over 2,400 miles and can be launched just outside of U.S. airspace. When launched, the AS-23 carries its 250 kiloton nuclear warhead, reaching its target in under two minutes at speeds of over 16 thousand miles per hour. The primary objectives for attacking Russia's strategic bomber force would be to destroy strategic bombers and other aircraft on the ground, crater airfield runways, damage other long-range aviation assets such as fuel storage and aircraft repair and production facilities. An effective attack on Russia's strategic bomber force would focus on the following strategic aviation targets. The main air bases at Shakova, Angles, Bella, and Ukraina, a training base at Rosin Heavy Bomber Flight Test Center, both Kavasan and Kazan Heavy Bomber Production Facilities, forward air bases, and additional air bases that could be used for the dispersing of strategic bombers, refueling tankers, or establishing air bases for potential Russian fighter escorts. A total of 73 300 kiloton W-70A warheads delivered by Minuteman 3 ICBMs would be allocated to destroy Russia's strategic bomber force. And as a result, grounded planes would be destroyed, runways would be cratered, making it impossible for heavy bombers to take off, and leaving surviving aircraft trapped. Up next, we have Russia's nuclear weapon storage facilities. While Russia has around 2,000 nuclear weapons currently deployed, it has an additional 4,000 nuclear weapons stockpiled at 13 national-level nuclear weapon storage sites. Therefore, destroying Russia's nuclear weapon storage sites would be a top priority. Due to their large size and hardened bunkers that are spaced out to ensure that one warhead can't take out an entire complex, attacking each national level nuclear weapon storage site will require a strike of 8 W78 300 kiloton warheads, amounting to a total of 104 Miniman 3 ICBMs. These 104 Miniman 3 ICBM warheads would reach their nuclear weapon storage targets within 30 minutes after launch, with a near 100% predicted kill rate, using 300 kiloton ground bursts. Next, we have Russia's nuclear weapon design and production complex. 
The core of Russia's and formerly Soviet nuclear weapon design and production complex is composed of 10 closed cities and one open city. These cities research, develop, test, and produce nuclear weapons that were provided to Soviet armed forces and that were deployed widely against Western militaries. What transpired at these locations throughout the Cold War was a central security concern for the United States and Western Europe for over 40 years. As these secret cities were discovered through U.S. intelligence in the 1950s, they became some of the highest priority targets for U.S. nuclear forces. No doubt, many or all remain on the target list today. The goal of an attack on Russia's nuclear weapon design and production complex would be to eliminate any future nuclear weapon design and production capability by destroying key facilities that contribute to the research, development, and production of Russia's nuclear weapons. U.S. war planners would target nuclear design laboratories, plutonium and tritium production reactors, chemical separation plants, uranium enrichment plants, and warhead assembly facilities. As a result, the attack would consist of 29 warheads, 9W87 300 kiloton warheads, and 20 W-78 300 kiloton warheads. The number of targets per city would depend on the number of production facility targets at each location. A total of 29 Miniman 3 ICBMs would reach their targets within 30 minutes after launch, detonating via airbursts at a height of 400 meters. Up next, we have Russia's command, control, and communications. In general, there are three primary targets associated with Russia's command, control, and communications. Space telecommand and Earth satellite stations and telecommunication centers. The first and most important targets for destroying Russia's military command and control and communications would be two space telecommand centers and 44 Earth satellite stations. These 46 satellite facilities perform critical functions that allow communications to flow between Russian leadership and deployed nuclear forces in a time of a crisis. Some of these critical functions include ballistic missile early warning detection, electronic intelligence communications, photo reconnaissance, remote sensing, radar calibration, navigation, meteorology, geodensity, and space activity. Since destroying Russia's satellite communication centers would be a high priority, an attack would be carried out by sea-based ballistic missile submarines using 46 W-88 warheads delivered from 11 Trident II missiles. 15 minutes after launch, 475 kiloton airbursts would incinerate Russia's satellite and space communication centers, severely degrading Moscow's ability to coordinate a retaliatory nuclear strike. The second primary target are Russia's telecommunication centers. These radio frequency broadcast centers serve as the primary communication nodes between Russian military command and its nuclear forces, although 174 targets would be applicable for a strike. Since some of these installations are near high population centers such as Moscow, it's assumed that only 91 targets would be hit with nuclear weapons to limit civilian casualties. 65 targets would be hit with the remaining Minuteman 3 missiles, being struck with 65 300 kiloton ground burst detonations occurring 30 minutes after launch. The remaining 26 targets would be destroyed with 26 475 kiloton ground burst detonations from five Trident II submarine launch ballistic missiles. Up next, we have Russia's road mobile ICBMs. Russia's World Mobile ICBM Force is comprised of 180 intercontinental ballistic missiles, each mounted on a 7-axle chassis mobile launch vehicle. Russia's land-based Road Mobile ICBM Force carries three missiles, 27 SS-25s armed with one 800 kiloton warhead per missile, 18 SS-27 Mod 1s also carrying an 800 kiloton warhead per missile, and 135 SS-27 Mod 2s armed with four 500 kiloton MIRV warheads per missile. Each missile is mounted on a 14 by 12 artillery truck designed and developed by MAZ, Minsk Automobile Plant, in what is now the country of Belarus. This mobile launcher is capable of moving through roadless terrain and launching 
launching a missile from any point along its route. When launched, these three-stage solid-field ICBMs have an operational range of 6,800 miles, travel at speeds of up to 16,000 miles per hour, and typically reach their targets in around 30 minutes. Accompanying the missile when it's deployed to the countryside are two other vehicles, a 4x4 mobile command post that carries the required support facilities, and a communications relay station that uses tropospheric communication antennas mounted on an extendable mast framework. Russia's rolled mobile ICBMs are located at seven bases, Vypolsovo, Tekovo, Yashkar Ola, Nizhny Tagil, Novosibirsk, Barnol, and Yerkutsk. In general, there are three types of targets associated with Russia's World Mobile ICBMs. Hardened organizational and or communication structures located at each base, 180 vehicle shelters and the 20 garrisons at each World Mobile ICBM base, and any of the 60 groups of three ICBM launcher vehicles that may disperse during a nuclear conflict. As with all things, there are advantages and disadvantages when attacking Russia's World Mobile ICBMs. The primary advantage is that Russia's World Mobile launchers are far easier to destroy than their hardened silo-based counterparts. Disabling a World Mobile launcher is simple. The vehicle only needs to be overturned. This is easily achieved with a thermal nuclear explosion. Whether located in hardened shelters on one of their seven bases, or even in the field, several of Russia's World Mobile launch vehicles can be threatened and destroyed over an area approximately 26 square kilometers by a single airburst detonation. Therefore, in the case of a total surprise attack, large numbers of road mobile launch vehicles in an unhardened shelter can be easily destroyed using a small amount of warheads. Secondly, Russia's road mobile ICBMs have a slower response time than their silo-based counterparts. Typically, road mobile ICBMs remain in garrison until tensions merit dispersal to the countryside. Therefore, the survivability of Russia's road mobile ICBMs depends heavily on adequate intelligence and advance warning of a pending attack. Furthermore, their dispersal in a crisis complicates command and control, making the steps to prepare for a launch far more time-consuming. The primary disadvantage of attacking Russia's road mobile ICBMs is that targeting dispersed road mobile ICBMs can be difficult. While the primary defense of Russia's silo-based ICBMs is their hardness, the primary defense of road mobile ICBMs is their ability to leave their bases and disperse, in Russia's case, into the surrounding forest. With sufficient warning time and insufficient satellite visibility for the attacking country to track mobile launchers, the area that road mobile ICBMs could be in would be too large to be bombarded by America's nuclear arsenal thus ensuring that Russia's road mobile ICBMs would survive an attack. Furthermore, not sufficiently destroying Russia's road mobile ICBMs in a first strike would put America's civilian population at high risk. Given that the SS-25 and SS-27 ICBMs carry only one high-yield warhead of probably limited accuracy, a recently declassified CIA document concluded that Russian war planners treat these 45 ICBMs as countervalue weapons aimed at high population centers in the continental U.S. Taking this vulnerability analysis into account, U.S. war planners would target Russia's road mobile ICBM force using Trident II submarine launch ballistic missiles, armed with 475 kiloton W-88 warheads. Aim points would be limited to the road mobile SS-27's operating bases and garrison targets. Two 475 kiloton ground bursts would be assigned to each of the seven operating bases and 20 garrisons. In all, an attack would consist of 54 warheads, with a total yield of 26.7 megatons. Warheads to reach their targets within 15 minutes after launch, with a near 100% predicted kill rate. Due to the fact that both locating and retargeting dispersed SS-27s in real time appears to be problematic, U.S. war planners would avoid targeting dispersed road mobile launchers.
In all, an estimated 746 U.S. warheads would be used in the counterforce portion of Major Attack Option 1. Although the U.S. PSYOP counterforce plan avoids military targets near civilian areas, the pure devastation from this attack would be massive. Earlier, I mentioned the importance of the term ground burst detonations. A ground burst detonation is a nuclear explosion in which a weapon is detonated on or slightly above the surface of the Earth. Under these conditions, the total area affected by the blast is less extensive than that for an airburst, but the resulting radioactive fallout is massive. As a result, an estimated 8 million Russians would be dead within 45 minutes after launch. Furthermore, due to the high levels of radioactive fallout, radiation sickness, starvation, and other environmental factors, U.S. war planners estimate that an additional 10 million casualties would occur over the next two weeks. Now let's take a look at the second and most devastating portion of Major Attack Option 1, Counter Value Targeting. In the Counter Value portion of Major Attack Option 1, the primary goal is to kill civilians and damage economic infrastructure. As such, the Counter Value Targeting approach prioritizes large cities and industrial centers, targets that a country inherently values. Counter Value Targeting is considered easy and cheap. Cities and factories are hard to protect, easy to identify, and are stationary, meaning the technical requirements of Counter Value Targeting are few, as are the number of nuclear weapons the United States needs to destroy its Russian targets. Though many experts believe that the United States or or Russia would not engage in counter-value targeting in a hypothetical nuclear exchange for the following reasons. First, targeting cities just to kill civilians is extremely and plainly illegal. Ending millions of lives with the push of a button is typically frowned upon. Secondly, counterforce targeting would better achieve the goal of winning a nuclear war. While a large portion of Russia's nuclear forces would certainly survive a first strike, over time, concealed nuclear weapon delivery systems like bombers and even submarines would have to reveal themselves. As a result, the U.S. would probably be able to take out a large portion of Russia's nuclear forces to secure a military defeat eventually. Lastly, countervalue targeting on the part of the U.S. or Russia would be suicidal. In other words, if the U.S. decided to target Russian cities, it would be risking the lives of tens or hundreds of millions of its citizens and the destruction of its economy. As of 2010, the U.S. explicitly states in its nuclear policy that it won't engage in countervalue targeting. But if American cities were targeted in a global nuclear exchange, the U.S. would certainly respond in kind. Even though a countervalue attack would be unlikely, how would the U.S. carry out one? What cities and how many Russian civilians would be targeted? Which weapons in America's nuclear arsenal would be used? What would the European continent look like going forward? And most importantly, how many Russian civilian casualties could we expect from a countervalue thermonuclear attack on Russia? To answer this question, we first need to discuss the concept of mutually assured destruction. Mutual assured destruction, also known as MAD, is a doctrine of military strategy and national security policy, in which a full-scale use of nuclear weapons by two or more opposing sides would cause the complete annihilation of both the attacker and the defender. MAD doctrine is based on the theory of deterrence, which holds that the threat of using nuclear weapons against the enemy prevents the enemy's use of those same weapons. So how many Russian civilians does the United States need to hold at risk to deter Russia from launching a nuclear attack? First, we need to go back to the year 1962. In a November 21st memo to President Kennedy, Secretary of Defense Robert McInerra sought to quantify the sufficient number of Russian civilians the United States would need to hold at risk to deter a nuclear attack by Russia. He stated that it's generally agreed that the vital and first objective to be met in full by our strategic nuclear forces is the capability for assured destruction. What amounts in kinds of destruction that we would have to be able to deliver cannot be answered precisely, but it seems to be reasonable to assume that the destruction of, say, 25% of its population, or 55 million people, and more than two-thirds of its industrial capacity would mean the destruction of the Soviet Union as a national society. Such a level of destruction would certainly represent an intolerable punishment to any industrialized nation, and thus should serve as an effective deterrent. Using McNamara's analysis, we can ascertain the amount of Russian civilians the United States would need to hold at risk to deter Russia from launching a first strike. 
As of 2023, Russia has an estimated population of 146 million people. Under the MAD doctrine, the United States would need to hold at least 25% of its population at risk, or 36.5 million Russians. Russia is currently comprised of 89 regions, within an area of 17.1 square kilometers, making it about as twice as big as the United States with half the population. The Ural Mountains split Russia into the European portion, that contains most of the people while the Asiatic portion includes most of the landmass. The 53 Russian regions west of the Urals have around three quarters of its total population. According to the last census, 22 of the 34 Russian cities with a population of over 500,000 were located in European Russia, including Moscow and St. Petersburg. As a result, an effective countervalue attack would focus on Russia's European section. Now that we know where the United States would attack, which nuclear weapons would the United States use to attack Russian cities? As discussed in our first video covering how the United States would fight a nuclear war, the US has three delivery options. Land-based intercontinental ballistic missiles, air-based strategic bombers, and sea-based ballistic missile submarines. With over 400 Minuteman III missiles spread throughout the U.S.'s rural countryside, America's land-based intercontinental ballistic missiles make up the most responsive leg of the nuclear triad. Within five minutes after an order from the President, the Minuteman III silo doors are ejected. The three-stage intercontinental ballistic missile screams out of its silo at speeds of 15,000 miles per hour, reaching a height of 700 miles in the upper atmosphere to deliver a 330 kiloton thermonuclear warhead to its target 8,000 miles away, with pinpoint accuracy in less than 30 minutes. And and it's because of their fast response time that we can assume that land-based intercontinental ballistic missiles wouldn't be used in a countervalue attack on Russian cities. Instead, U.S. war planners reserve these weapons for high-priority targets that need to be destroyed quickly, such as military bases and the enemy country's nuclear forces. What about America's air-based strategic bombers? Although air-based strategic bombers are the U.S.'s most flexible option, with the advantage of being able to change targets mid-flight or to be called back if tensions cool, their slow response time and vulnerability to attack when grounded make them the less ideal choice. This leaves us with only one option, America's sea-based ballistic missile submarines. The U.S. Navy operates a fleet of 14 Ohio-class ballistic missile submarines. Each submarine carries 20 Trident II submarine-launched ballistic missiles, the single most destructive weapon in America's nuclear arsenal. The Trident II SLBM is armed with either four or five 475 kiloton W-88 warheads. U.S. SLBM warheads, America's premier strategic nuclear weapons, are the very definition of accurate and reliable. And when combined with the Trident to SLBM 7,000 kilometer range, the United States can hold at risk any adversary's hardened military targets or valued assets. Targeting Russia's population centers using Trident II submarine-launched ballistic missiles can be somewhat tricky. To better understand this, we first need to take a look at how the Trident II SLBM's MIRV delivery system works. Once the launch command is given, a steam generator system is activated, igniting a solid field grain motor. Steam exhaust is fed into cooling water, causing gas to expand within the launch tube, ejecting the missile upward. Within seconds, the missile breaches the surface of the water, and the first stage motor ignites. 60 seconds after launch, the first stage motor drops off, and the second stage motor ignites. 80 seconds after launch, the missile shroud is ejected, and the second stage motor terminates. Each warhead is guided by a multiple independently targetable re-entry vehicle, or MIRV, allowing a single Trident two missile to deliver up the five warheads to five separate targets. To achieve this, a post-boost vehicle, or bus, moves into its free flight suborbital ballistic flight path, where it maneuvers using small onboard rocket motors and its advanced inertial guidance system to begin its warhead delivery procedure. The bus takes up a ballistic trajectory that will deliver a MIRV warhead to a target and releases the warhead on that trajectory. It then maneuvers to a different trajectory, releasing another warhead, and repeats the process for all of its warheads. Once released, the warhead spin gas generators ignite, stabilizing them for atmospheric re-entry. From there, each warhead is armed in flight, where they re-enter the atmosphere at high speeds and are detonated as airbursts at a height of 2,000 meters. Airburst detonations are preferred in countervalue strikes on civilian population centers for two reasons. Firstly, airburst detonations maximize the amount of damage delivered from a thermal nuclear explosion. When the primary blast wave from the explosion strikes the ground, another blast wave is produced by reflection. At a certain distance from ground zero, the primary and secondary blast waves fuse near the ground, combining and creating a shockwave that's far more forceful than a ground burst. Secondly, air burst detonations also minimize radioactive fallout. By detonating in the air, the fireball doesn't touch the ground, limiting the amount of debris that's vaporized and drawn up in a radioactive cloud that can travel several miles from ground zero. 
An airburst detonation delivered from a single Trident II W88 warhead with a yield of 475 kilotons over the city of Moscow, for example, would have catastrophic consequences. Upon detonation, an intensely hot and luminous fireball is formed, expanding to a radius of 710 meters, vaporizing everything in its path. Those near the blast would be evaporated, and within a 2-kilometer radius, all buildings would likely be destroyed, killing 120,000 Russian civilians in a matter of seconds. Very soon after detonation, a destructive blast wave develops, moving rapidly away from the fireball. Because of its extremely high temperature, the shockwave emitted would contain high levels of thermal radiation, causing third-degree burns and clothing to instantly ignite into flames. As a result, around half the people between 2 and 13 kilometers are killed from burns, debris, smoke, collapsed buildings, and radiation sickness which translates roughly to an additional 640,000 Russian fatalities over a period of 60 seconds. Since the warheads from the Trident II SLBM are merged, the five warheads from a single missile are restricted to attack targets within an area known as the missile's footprint. The size and shape of the Trident II's footprint is classified, but we can assume that aim points for warheads from a single missile can't be separated by more than 300 miles. As a result, targeting Russian cities using Trident IIs are less optimal due to the constraint posed by the missile's MIR footprint. For example, a large but geographically isolated city like Kaliningrad would be targeted because doing so would inefficiently allocate all five warheads to the vicinity of the city. Instead, these warheads could be used more efficiently elsewhere, inflicting more damage. Although there's no publicly available information on the United States' Russian countervalue targeting plan, based on what we learned from McNamara's MAD doctrine, we estimate that around 200 warheads would be used in a Russian countervalue strike. Here we selected 200 of Russia's most populated cities, excluding geographically isolated areas where the delivery of multiple warheads would be less optimal. As a result, an effective strike would involve at least 200-475 kiloton W-88 warheads delivered from around 50 Trident II missiles using airburst detonated at a height of 2,000 meters. Casualties and fatalities would be massive, far exceeding the required 25% destruction rate of Russia's civilian population. The attack would take around 15 minutes once ordered from the president. In all, an estimated 275 U.S. warheads would be used in the countervalue portion of Major Attack Option 1. Even though significantly less warheads were used, their higher yield, coupled with the targeting of urban areas, would result in blast effects far worse than that of the counterforce portion. This is due to a phenomenon the U.S. war planners call superfires. When detonated, a 475 kiloton nuclear weapon produces temperatures of around 100 million degrees Celsius at its center, about five times that which occurs at the center of the sun. This intense heat would instantly ignite numerous simultaneous fires over vast areas of the surrounding terrain. Hurricane force winds on the ground would develop, causing air temperatures within the fire zone to quickly exceed that of boiling water, triggering super fires throughout each Russian city targeted. As a result, 45 million fatalities alone would occur over a period of 15 minutes. Furthermore, due to the spreading of super fires near targeted population centers, radiation sickness, adverse changes in the atmosphere, global food production, and availability, U.S. war planners estimate that an additional 50 56 million casualties would occur over the next two weeks.
with Russia successfully destroyed and over 43 million Russians killed. When news of this is broadcast back to the United States, the social and economic chaos that would follow can be described in two words, pure chaos. For starters, millions of Americans would begin fleeing from large cities, causing Mexico and Canada to close their borders, further deepening the suffering. Even if there was no immediate Russian retaliation, rioting, looting, and a general social breakdown would occur. Unfortunately, no immediate Russian retaliation just isn't the case. The hard truth is that the United States just got its missiles out in time, and America is already under attack. Now let's take a look at Russia's American nuclear war plan, its US targets, the Russian nuclear weapons used, and the overall outcome of a thermonuclear attack on the United States. 